Well, good evening. Welcome to Colorado Mesa University, located in the heart of Western Colorado, Grand Junction. I'm John Marshall, president of CMU, and I'm pleased to serve as moderator of our 2022 Colorado Gubernatorial Forum tonight. Tonight's broadcast is made possible with support from the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel, Colorado Public Radio, and KRCC. In addition to our live video stream tonight, we're also joined by listeners around Colorado, heard on the Southern Ute Tribal Radio, Four Corners Public Radio, and the Gunnison Valley on KBUT, in Carbondale on KDNK, in Boulder on KGNU, in Montrose and Paonia on KVNF, and on KFFR in Winter Park. We also welcome listeners of Aspen Public Radio. Now, unlike any other forum this election cycle, tonight's event is completely produced by CMU faculty and students. And unlike other debates this election cycle, tonight's forum is really intended to give camp candidates ample time to discuss their thoughts on policy matters important to our region and our state. Now, I'd like to welcome Democrat Jared Polis and Republican Heidi Ganahl to Grand Junction. Thank you both for joining us. Both campaigns have agreed to the rules for tonight's forum and each will respond to a series of questions from our panelists, whom I'll now introduce. From Colorado Public Radio, we're joined by reporter Andy Kenny, from the Daily Sentinel, audience engagement director Gretchen Reist, and from CMU, our student body vice president, Jason Hunter. Each question from our panelists will be posed to both candidates, and each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond. Whomever gets the first question will have a 30 second rebuttal, and as moderator, I reserve the right to interrupt candidates if you go terribly over time. <laughs> We have one hour together, so let's get started. I'll now recognize our first candidate for opening remarks. Mr. Polis, you won the coin toss this evening. Uh, you have two minutes for your opening. Thank you, uh, President Marshall, CMU, Colorado Public Radio, and the Grand Junction Sentinel for hosting this conversation tonight. And thank you, student leaders uh, of CMU for stepping up and being a part of this. Of course, it's great uh, to be in Grand Junction in Mesa County here tonight. I was just uh, here in Western Colorado a couple weeks ago, celebrating the opening of our new police building in Montrose, and also gathering some policy folks for the Western Governors Association, which I chair, to really learn about CMU's work leading the way on geothermal energy. A lot of folks might not know this, but 70% of the buildings on campus are geothermally heated, and President Marshall had the foresight to calculate what those savings mean for students. It actually means 2% lower tuition uh, by using the heat beneath our feet, and we look forward to working with CMU and others across the state to improve uh, access to low cost heating and cooling. Four years ago, uh, when I ran for governor of the great state of Colorado, I came before you with several goals and bold commitments as governor. Uh, one, I said we would get preschool and kindergarten done for every kid. At the time, Colorado only had half day kindergarten. Parents in Mesa County had to pay $450 a month for full day kindergarten. I'm proud to say in my first year, we got that done, uh, bipartisan, and then we also got our initiative passed for universal preschool, which starts fall of next year. I also said we lower the cost of healthcare in Colorado, and we reduce the cost of the exchange. This is for folks who don't get insurance through work, who don't qualify for Medicare or Medicaid, who buy their own, by over 20% across the state, more than 25% here in Mesa County. And I also said uh, that we'd make sure to save people money and reduce costs across the board. And uh, we're moving forward with a hundred different ways to save people money. And we hope to hear even more ideas tonight. The largest property tax cut in the history of Colorado for 2023 and 2024. Uh, and we look forward to continuing that work ahead. So today I stand before you asking to be your governor for the next four years, because there's a lot of work ahead to make Colorado one of the safest states in the nation and for more affordable housing close to where people work. Thank you, Mr. Polis. Ms. Ganahl, your two minute opening. Thank you, John. I'm Heidi Ganahl. I'm a mom on a mission that's pretty darn mad. I'm furious actually about what's happened to our state in the last four years. And Polis is the problem. He's leading our state in the wrong direction. I'm excited to be in Grand Junction for the second debate here. Jared didn't show up for the first one with Club 20, but I care about the people of the Western Slope and I'm happy to be back and discuss these important issues. Colorado, don't let Polis control us. He's destroyed our energy industry, suffocated our farmers and ranchers, appointed activists to our ag and energy boards, and grown the size of government by over 20%. I'm a seasoned leader, a small town Colorado girl, committed to getting our beautiful state back on the right track. Here's how. In my first week as governor, I'll introduce a comprehensive public safety bill. 
I will fully fund the police. I will make any possession of fentanyl a felony and cancel our status as a sanctuary state to allow ICE to do their job. As governor, I'll unleash Colorado's economy and put more money back into your pocket. By taking our great state to zero income tax over year, eight years without raising other taxes or cutting services and reducing red tape to make housing affordable again. Together, we'll make it easier to live, work, and raise a family here. Speaking of families, I'll launch the Read to Succeed initiative to make sure our kids can read by the end of third grade. Horrible numbers just came out, and 60% of our kids in Colorado cannot read at grade level. I will go all in on school choice, make sure that the funding follows the family, give power back to parents. I'm offering a brighter future here in Colorado. Transparency and honesty are crucial. Jared, I just now released three years of my tax returns on my website, and I call you to do the same. I have nothing to hide, do you? Voters deserve to know the truth. Colorado, I will always tell you the truth. Ms. Ganahl, thank you for your opening comments. Now let's jump right into the questions. Andy Kenny has the first question. Andy? I believe the first question goes to the governor. That's correct. Should you continue as Colorado's governor for another four years, you'll be tasked with renegotiating the 1922 Colorado River Compact, which is due for some significant revisions by 2026. In a scenario of increased need and less water among the member states, what will you do to preserve Colorado's future access to the water it needs? So I, I think you saw a great contrast in the opening remarks. Uh, my opponent identified herself as a mad mom. I identify myself as a happy dad of two great kids, 11 and eight, raising my kids in the best state uh, of all the states in the country. They love the outdoors. We love our freedom. I will always protect our freedom. Look, uh, water is critical for the success of Colorado. And with a hotter, drier climate, we know that we need to step up and do more. So in addition to making sure we put Colorado first in fighting for all of our rights under interstate compacts, including the Colorado River Compact, and we're in a stronger legal position and also a stronger position because of the nature of water because as an upper basin state, uh, the states that are going to have the harshest cutbacks are, of course, California, Nevada, and Arizona. Uh, but we know that we need to do more. Uh, and of course, increased storage is part of this, but we also need to make sure that we have best practices in ag, increasing profitability for our farmers and ranchers, we have more water efficient practices. And we also need to connect for the first time in Colorado, our housing policy with our water policy. Uh, what that means is as we look at our state with our current population, as more people come to Colorado uh, from Texas or California because of the great quality of life and economic opportunity and freedom that our state has, we need to make sure that we do it in a way that's sustainable from a water perspective and doesn't uh, increase water usage beyond our capacity to provide water to our farmers and ranchers. I oppose diversion from the western slope uh, across water basins, and I will always fight to make sure that uh, one part of Colorado is not pitted against another Colorado part of Colorado because we're all in our water security future together. Jared, I am mad. I am a bad mom. We have skyrocketing crime, out of control inflation, a huge fentanyl problem that's killing our kids, and our kids can't read, write, or do math at grade level. I have a right to be angry, and I represent a lot of parents, but I also represent a lot of farmers and ranchers across this beautiful state that are very upset about how they've been treated. You know, hosting a meat out day is not exactly a great way to respect the farmers and ranches and ag industry that's so important to our state, as well as supporting the introduction of wolves here. that will be a very difficult for our farmers and ranchers to navigate. When we talk about water, we have to talk about storage. Store, store, store. We've got to store the water that's rightly ours. And you've got to have a governor who won't cede control to the federal government, but will hold firm and stand strong against the federal government and the other states who want to take the water that's rightly ours. Of course, con conservation is part of that. Colorado has been a leader in conservation for many, many years. But at this point, we've got to protect our water that's rightly ours. We can't let them take more than what's ours in that negotiation in the Colorado River Compact. And we've got to get these storage projects through, which are being hamstrung by the federal government. We do have good water supplies, but we've got to keep them here in Colorado and not let them flow out of our state like we're doing now. You need a governor that will stand strong, stand up to the federal government, and do what's right to protect our water. Mr. Polis, 30-second rebuttal. Look, you can't store your way out of a drought. The water simply isn't there. 
Uh, I would also highlight I visited in Silt just a few weeks ago, uh, an indoor uh, growing operation for lettuce and salad greens. Of course, with local impact on lights, those need to be addressed, but fundamentally, new technology in agriculture reducing water usage by over 90%. We can and we must do better, and I'll make sure we don't put pit rural Colorado against urban Colorado because we're all in this together for Colorado's future to make sure our best days are still ahead. Thank you, Mr. Polis. Ms. Ganola, the second question is to you, and we'll go to Gretchen for that. There's a lot of concern in this part of the state about Wall Street hedge funds purchasing Colorado water rights. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the role of the free market in Colorado water? And are our current laws aligned with that? Or do they need to change to ensure that Coloradans maintain control over their water rights? Well, first and foremost, I have to be a governor for the people of Colorado and protect our water rights here before we um, let it go to New York or Wall Street. And I believe there are solutions on this front by allowing communities to have maybe a first right of refusal or essentially stop um, outside interests from doing the wrong things with our water. We've got to also stop China from buying up our farmland. And that's happening under Jared Polis's watch. He was named one of the China friendly governors by a think tank over there. We should not be selling our farmlands to China. That's a debacle. It shouldn't happen under any governor's watch. And we've got to do again, protect our water rights and make decisions about Colorado water here in Colorado, but also respect property rights, protect the farmers and ranchers, but also protect the communities and find ways to meet in the middle. Mr. Polis? Well, 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 look, I've been very outspoken uh, in my criticisms of, of China. In fact, we hosted the Taiwanese president uh, here in Colorado two years ago, and I was proud to celebrate uh, Taiwan Independence Day just a few weeks ago with our friends that suffer under the threat uh, of Chinese invasion every day. And we stand in solidarity as a state with the people of Ukraine, uh, with the people of Taiwan, and with everybody who aspires to the freedoms that we can't take for granted here in our own state and nation, but we fight every day to protect and to expand. Uh, water is Colorado's lifeblood. And the truth is, when my opponent had the chance to speak out against the purchase of water rights from the San Luis Valley for her home county of Douglas County, she didn't. I oppose buy and dry policies in our own state. Yes, there's a threat from Wall Street in New York. There's even a threat from the fast growing suburbs of our state to make sure that they do not succeed in drying up rural Colorado. I'll always put rural Colorado and make sure an ag interest first to make sure that we can, we can maintain a strong and growing rural economy and at the same time increase our water efficiency in the urban and suburban areas where a lot of our population growth is. This can all 30 second. Remote. Yes, I actually did speak up about that and said I don't I don't believe that was the right solution for the San Luis Valley and Douglas County. And I live in Douglas County, but I also respect greatly the farmers and ranchers across our state and the landowners across our state. And that deal isn't going anywhere. So it's kind of a mute discussion at this point. But what is important is not letting outside interests come into Colorado and take our water rights like outside states, the federal government or China taking our farmland. Andy, if you would ask question number three to Mr. Polis. Governor, uh, it's time to talk about transportation. In 1968, the government began the Eisenhower Tunnel bores and eventually completed I-70 through Glenwood Canyon in 1992, creating this new connection between the Front Range and the West Slope. Now that connection is threatened by wildfire, mudslides, traffic, uh, all of the above. What is your idea for the next big project beyond even what's on the agenda now? Do you have an east-west moonshot that you would like to see? So, you know, my uh, parents moved to Colorado in 1970. So my, my father tells me stories from before the tunnel was open the other way, uh, where if you did go up to the mountains or the high country for a weekend, it could easily turn into a week or even 10 days uh, at times during winter when the pass couldn't be open. Uh, thank goodness for the foresight uh, of our forebears in investing in those major access projects. Look, we've delivered on transportation funding for Grand Junction in Western Colorado. We were excited to support and get through uh, a quarter million dollars for the pedestrian and bicycle improvements in the gateway to Grand Junction. Of course, the Palisade Plunge, uh, not too far from here. Delta County, Hillside Street, the, uh, along Hillside, West Main Street and Montrose, $2 million, including better access for uh, people with disabilities. But we also know there's a lot of work ahead. Um, my opponent said she would repeal the bipartisan uh, infrastructure package that we pass as the state. Uh, she says she wants to move it from a fee to tax or a tax to fee, but whatever it is, what she wants to do is eliminate 
uh, the funding source for half of the state patrol. It's a dedicated funding source. Thank goodness we don't have to go to the legislature to ask to fund our police. She would eliminate half the funding for our state patrol. In addition, it would gut the funding for our roads and bridges. When you talk about the Highway 70 corridor, I'm excited about the future of technology. Um, are we there today with a viable technology that works and is economical? Not yet. But I think the future is bright. It's going to be something like maglev or high-speed rail. I explore it. I look at the numbers all the time. I hope that it's something that we're able to move forward with in my next term, but it really depends on whether we can make the numbers work for Colorado to reduce traffic, clean air quality, and increase access to our mountain communities, including Grand Junction. This can all 90 seconds. Well, Jared's not telling the truth, as usual. I will never defund the police. My dad was a police officer. I am so worried about crime in our state. I was actually endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police. I'm very proud of that. They believe that I have the right plan to make things right here in Colorado and have the backs of law enforcement. When it comes to transportation, passing a $5 billion tax bill that doesn't fix the roads is not the right solution for Colorado. If he cares so much about rural Colorado, then why did he just cut the rural pavement plan in half through CDOT? That's not the way you respect and be a voice for rural Colorado and fix our roads. What I'm going to do is put 260, that bill that passed, that tax bill, back to a vote of the people of Colorado. And I'd like to give them a specific list of projects, which is actually on my website. I've worked with trans transportation experts from around the state and make sure that people know exactly where those dollars are gonna go and take the dollars that were approved as taxes and fees, make the fees taxes, which they should be, they are, and actually put a sunset on it after 10 years so it's not an everlasting tax on all of you in Colorado and actually get the darn roads fixed finally. And if he cares about clean, and clean, clean land, clean air, clean water, then let's fix the congestion at 270 and I-25 where some of the worst ozone effects happen in Colorado. That project was canceled by CDOT, both projects were. So let's fix the roads, let's make it a voter approved process instead of doing it behind their backs and let's fix the roads with the money that they approved in the legislature. Look, what my opponent's saying just doesn't add up. She's saying fund multi-billion dollar projects in Denver, and at the same time saying somehow we need more money to fund rural roads, at the same time she's gutting the funding source. Uh, I believe in math, I believe in a reality-based government. We're gonna do our best to deliver the most efficient improvements possible with the resources we have. The question was about the moonshot. There's a lot of great technology, whether it's Hyperloop, whether it's the Boring Company. There's so many exciting technologies on the horizon. I'm a futurist, I'm a technologist, that's my passion. I look forward to exploring every opportunity uh, for really transporting this corridor to the next century. Thank you, Mr. Polis. Our fourth question comes from student Jason Hunter. Yes, sir. I went to high school in Colorado Springs mm -hmm. and chose to come to CMU to pursue my degree. I would love to pursue a career in the Western Slope, but unfortunately, it seems like most economic opportunities in Colorado exist up the I-25 corridor. What will you do as governor to address this economic rural urban divide that young people on the Western Slope face? Well, thank you for that. And we talked earlier, we both grew up near Monument, now that I don't know Paso County, and I'm proud to be from there. So what do we do to make it okay for you to stay in rural Colorado and have a successful career? Well, first thing we can do is make sure our economy is thriving in rural Colorado and get our energy industry back to work. You know, it has been decimated under the current administration. We can't produce energy here where we produce it cleaner than anywhere on the planet. Colorado has the second largest natural gas reserve in the country, and we produce the cleanest energy here. We have the strictest regulations. So if we want clean air, clean land, clean water, let's produce it here and get our industry back on track. Now, the other thing we have to do is make sure that you have access to um, employees and affordable housing who can stay here and work for you if you're a job creator or if you're working for a corporation. And affordable housing has become a huge issue over on the Western Slope all over Colorado. And a fourth of the cost of new housing is regulatory. So what can I do as governor about that? Well, I can make sure that any regulations from the state are relaxed. I can make sure that we have a reasonable approach to green energy regulations on housing. Going to all electric, like they're trying to do over here with Excel, is not, it's not feasible. So we've gotta be realistic, we can go green. We can also provide affordable housing if we reduce regulations and provide innovations and new ways of doing housing, which um, we, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening around co-housing, community development, small houses, tiny houses, the list goes on. I'm excited about the future. 
Mr. Polis, 90 seconds. There are so many great economic opportunities in western Colorado and rural Colorado. Uh, one of the areas we focus on is location independent employment because many people want to live in and around the world class outdoor recreation areas of Mesa County of western Colorado and be able to work for a major global company or perhaps even a company in Denver that they go in once a month and work remotely. Those opportunities continue to increase. We want to make sure that we continue to support the outdoor recreation industry, uh, which ties into our goal of, of removing barriers to access to our outdoor areas. We reduce the cost of a state park pass from over $80 to less than $29 a year next year. Opened up a new state park in Dotsero and Trinidad and Southern Colorado, Fisher's Peak. And we also funded projects like the Palisade Plunge to provide world-class recreation opportunities right here in Mesa County. Look, when natural gas prices go up, of course, there's more activity and jobs in Mesa County. That's a good thing for Mesa County. What it also is, though, is it's a bad thing for utility customers and ratepayers, which are all the rest of us. So, of course, Colorado is going to continue to produce. When the prices are high, production will go up. But we need to make sure that we wean ourselves off of natural gas to power our own grid, because that's the reason that Excel and other providers have told us that rates are going to go up over the next few months. It's because the cost of natural gas has increased. We want to make sure that we chart our energy independence in Colorado and across the country. We're blessed with great solar and wind resources in addition to our traditional energy resources as well as geothermal resources, which CMU has already tapped into to save students more than 2% a year. I look forward to continuing to work hard to make sure we save customers money on utility bills and, of course, support jobs in our energy sector. Ms. Canal, 30 seconds. Thank you, John. Well, if Jared, if you care about young people having an opportunity to live and work here, Excel Energy's heating said the heating bills this winter will go up 54%. Young people, senior citizens, families cannot afford to foot that bill. We've got to put our energy industry back to work, and we can be in all of the above energy state. But I also wonder why we aren't looking at nuclear and some other opportunities. That was turned down in the legislature this last session to even study it. It doesn't make sense if we truly want a great environment. Question number five is from Andy. Uh, Moffitt County generally, the city of Craig in particular, are going to take a really significant economic hit when their coal mine and their coal-fired plant are shut down by 2030 in large part because of policy choices and the pursuit of renewable energy at the state level. What hope can you offer residents of those areas that they're not living in a future ghost town? And what will happen to the local governments, the school districts, and the people? So first of all, the increase in utility rates my opponent cited is entirely due to the spike in natural gas prices. Now that's largely due to the war in Ukraine and other factors, but it shows why we can't rely on this global commodity and, and take away control from Coloradans and give it to people across the world. We experienced the same thing with the winter storms in Texas from two years ago. Coloradans were left holding the bag, not just Coloradans, Oklahomans, Texans, many others, because it was passed along to ratepayers when natural gas price prices spiked. We need to be energy independent. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're not beholden to international commodities markets or the decisions of Rus Russian dictators. Look, uh, we were the first state in the country to not only create but, su but support and fund a just transition office to work on the future for communities that have traditionally worked in the fossil fuel industry and in coal, including Craig and Hayden, uh, and of course working with the Pueblo commissioners on the retirement of the Comanche coal plant. The truth is that coal is the most expensive form of energy on the grid right now, 8 to 10 cents per kilowatt hour. New solar energy is in the 2 to 3 cent per kilowatt hour range, wind energy uh, about 4 cents per kilowatt hour, depending on the scale of the project. Uh, but the sooner that we can stop subsidizing uh, coal by forcing consumers to pay more, the more we'll save money for Coloradans. And of course we want to make sure we do this in a way that invests in a strong future. For Craig, for Hayden, supporting the outdoor recreation industry, advanced manufacturing, geothermal. Colorado is part of a group of states that we're leading with Utah, New Mexico, and Wyoming for a hydrogen hub for federal funding, great opportunities in the hydrogen economy. I believe that Colorado, Craig and Hayden's best days, are still ahead. And if I'm reelected governor, we'll work to make it happen. It's going all 90 seconds. Well, from what I hear from the families that are really suffering in the coal community, there hasn't been much of a just transition. They're not getting the help they need. It's very sad to watch these communi communities really struggle, especially when we have one of the largest natural gas reserves in the country right here under our feet that we can produce it. And we can get great jobs going again and provide dollars back to schools in these communities. You know, we can have an all of the above energy approach that works. He likes to talk about subsidies. Talk about subsidies. Let's talk about solar and wind. It's all subsidies. We've got to make sure we produce natural gas here instead of buying it from Saudi Arabia or Venezuela. 
that is all about national security. Right now, we're looking at it, you know, front and center in what's happening internationally. So let's produce energy here in Colorado where we do it better than anybody else and put people back to work and help our, our communities thrive around this state. You know, it's heartbreaking that we are buying energy from all over the planet, bad, nefarious actors, when we can do it right here in this beautiful state and watch our local communities thrive. That's what I want to do for Colorado. I want to put our energy industry back to work. I'll look at nuclear, I'll look at hydro and other ways that we can produce energy so that Colorado doesn't have to worry about our energy independence here or internationally. You know, it's a very, very rough time internationally. Let's do everything we can to make Colorado the leader in making us safe again here in America. Mr. Polo's 30 second rebuttal. Look, Colorado is both the producer of energy and we're consumers of energy. We all pay our utility bills every month. And of course, when prices are higher, natural gas and oil now, that's good on the production side. Production's going up in Western Colorado, production's going up in Weld County and other parts of the state, but it's tough on consumers, which is why we need to make sure we double down on saving people money, investing in the clean energy transition. Well, of course, uh, as long as it's economical and we can be profit continuing to produce oil and gas in the most climate efficient manner here in Colorado. Gretchen, you've got question number six. We've seen a sharp increase in homelessness, including street homelessness and vagrancy, <coughs> in Grand Junction and other Western Slope communities. It is now a statewide problem. And the growth of it suggests that the local responses are not solving the issue. What should the statewide response be? What would you do differently? Well, again, Polis and his policies are the problem. Homelessness has grown by a third in the last couple of years, and we've spent, let's see, $1.7 billion from 2021 to 20, we will spend into 2023. And it's not fixing the problem, it's getting worse. We've got to stop open air drug use. We can do this with care and compassion, but tough love. It's not fair for homeless folks to be living on the streets. There's nothing compassionate about that. We need to get them the care they need, the support they need, and we've got to stop the flow of fentanyl into our state. We are one of the worst states for fentanyl in this entire country because Jared Polis declared us a sanctuary state and made it impossible for ICE agents and law enforcement to stop it flowing into our southern border of Colorado. We've also got to make felony, make a, any, any possession of fentanyl a felony. It's not working the way the law was written in that he signed. We've got to do what we can to clean up our streets. It directly ties to homelessness and crime. And law enforcement is saying their hands are really tied. They're having a tough time getting the job done because of this catch and release theory and this desire to keep people out of jail. Well, we have the fourth highest recidivism rate in the country right here. That means repeat offenders are doing most of the crime because we're not keeping bad guys in jail and letting law enforcement do their job. I will have the backs of law enforcement and the first dollar I spend is on public safety and I'll replace everyone in charge of public safety, of the Justice Department, of Department of Corrections, and I'll make sure that the parole board does its job and keeps people in jail. Mr. Polis, 90 seconds. You know, my opponent has talked about some of my appointments, but the one appointment that she's had as a gubernatorial candidate is to choose the lieutenant governor. Uh, she chose an election ayer as her lieutenant governor. Uh, our wonderful lieutenant governor, Diane Primavera, is here with us tonight, and she believes in democracy and the integrity of collection, elections, both in Colorado and across the United States country as well. Look, the truth is fentanyl has been, is, and will be illegal in Colorado as long as I'm governor of this state. We also work very closely with ICE and FBI on fentanyl uh, distribution rings and going after criminals. And if they're American, we convict them here. If they are uh, foreign nationals, they're promptly deported. We work with ICE and FBI every Every day and have great relationships with both federal law enforcement agencies. The truth is that we know that as a state, we need to step up and work with our cities to do more for homelessness. One city where uh, homelessness has gone down since 2019 is Colorado Springs. So what we did is I hired away their homelessness advisor to work for us at the state. Andy Phelps would work with Mayor Southers. Great success story. Aurora is implementing some new policies as well. The state's role, of course, is to support our local governments in their efforts to reduce homelessness and make our communities safer. Part of that is housing. We need more affordable housing opportunities, of course, including supportive housing, but we also need to make sure we can provide drug rehabilitation and treatment for those who need it, as well as better mental health services, which we're investing in working with the city of Aurora, and we hope to work with Denver and other cities on additional treatment, as well as Western Colorado, to make sure that no matter where you are in our state, you can get the help you need to get off the streets and, uh, and back into the workforce to support yourself and your family.
Ms. Canal, 30-second rebuttal. You know, Jared's had four years to fix these problems, and instead it's gotten much, much worse, whether it's crime, homelessness, inflation. And he's like, he, he likes to bring up my lieutenant governor, who we've both said, Joe Biden's our president. You can see it all over the place because of skyrocketing crime, out of control inflation, homelessness everywhere, our kids can't read. But you know what's really sad is that he had to spend $25 million in the last couple months with his groups to say that I am all these things when they're not true. I'm here to tell the truth, guys. I'm a mom who cares deeply about this state and will do everything I can to fix it. Jason, you've got the next question. Yes, sir. As a student body vice president, I'm proud that Colorado Mesa runs a tight budget and charges the lowest tuition and fees of all Colorado universities. Unfortunately, the amount of money the state of Colorado allocates per student for schools like CMU, Metro State, and Colorado Community Colleges is dramatically lower than the statewide average. As governor, what will you do to equalize funding for institutions like Metro, Colorado Mesa, and Community College who together serve the overwhelming majority of Colorado's first generation, low income, and minority students? Uh, so this is another you know, contrast. While CMU has done a great job keeping rates down, the one thing my opponent was in charge of, CU, Boulder, increased tuition and fees and costs by over 22% for students during her time there. We need to drive more efficiency at our institutions of higher education. I'm proud of CMU's work, not just to help keep tuition low, and of course to highlight the contributions of free and low-cost energy to that, but also the work on zero textbook fees. We instituted a Z degree program across the state. Community colleges like Front Range and others have entire degrees with zero textbook costs. Right now today, CMU has dozens uh, I think over a hundred courses that have zero textbook costs associated with them because they use open source collaborative textbooks. We're looking to facilitate and encourage that kind of investment, encourage administrative consolidation on the back end to better, more efficiently deliver services to students. We've made it free across our community college systems. And you might know CMU stands unique as both a community college and a four-year college housed under the same governance at the same campus, seamless transition. It's now free to get certificates as an EMT, uh, a, a nurse technician, a phlebotomist uh, to get those uh, great upwardly mobile goals, but also needed jobs in our healthcare workforce in our community. It's free to do that across our community college system. When you reduce costs and can pass the savings along to students, people step up and take advantage of the great opportunities that this state offers. The truth is there's great jobs out there and great opportunities, but just to make sure we need, we just need to make sure we remove barriers that stand in the way to people achieving their goals, including reducing costs at our institutions of higher education. Ms. Canal, 90 seconds. Thank you. I'm so proud of the work I've done at CU over the last six years. I'm one of nine regents. Jared knows this, and we have a board that votes on things. And I have fought like heck to keep tuition low and fees low. And I am always the voice trying to push back on any increases at cost at CU. And I'll do so as governor when it comes to our budget as well. You know, if we want to talk about the cost of living here, inflation is at its highest rate in the country here in Colorado, 16% since Joe Biden took office. That's costing you, as a Colorado family, an extra $11,700 a year to work, live, and raise a family here. That's $1,000 extra a month. Not to mention your heating bills are going crazy right now. We've got to do all we can to lower cost, especially in, when it comes to getting a college degree. Right now, the administrative bloat is out of control. The mandates that the governor and his staff and administrators have put on higher ed are incredibly expensive to maintain. We need to get those dollars back into the classroom and pay faculty more, teachers more, not just in higher education, but in K through 12. The average classroom in Colorado gets 250,000 in funding in K through 12, and only 50,000 of that goes to the teachers. We've got to pay our teachers more. We've got to make class sizes smaller. And most of all, we need to give power back to parents to make choice, to make different choices if their kids aren't learning to read. I plan to fund the families, not the system, and make sure that parents can move their kids to a better choice if they're not learning how to read in their current schools. Mr. Polis, 30 second rebuttal. Uh, you know, um, I, many of you know I come from an education background. I chair the State Board of Education. I founded uh, two charter schools, served as superintendent of one. I strongly support uh, the ability of parents to choose the best education that fits the needs of their kids. Uh, you know, my own researchers have told me that my opponent voted for 17% increases. The costs and fees went up 22%. But, you know, she tries to not associate herself with that, but she actually did vote for 17% of those increases. And of course, that's higher than the tuition at CMU has gone up and many other institutions across the state. So I ask you, is that what qualifies you for a promotion? Thank you, Mr. Polis. Question 
Uh, next question comes from Gretchen. Fentanyl deaths are at an all-time high in the state. Colorado has done a lot to make overdose reversal drugs widely available. And the legislature earlier this year approved money for the distribution of fentanyl test strips. Mm -hmm. Does that go far enough or should Colorado be doing more to advance harm reduction strategies? Oh my goodness, we're facing a horrible crisis when it comes to fentanyl. I've talked a lot about the parents that I've met who've lost their young people, their, their kids, to fentanyl poisoning, not overdose because they didn't know it was laced with fentanyl when they were experimenting or taking a pill. Um, but here's the thing, we've lost more people in Colorado to drug overdose since Jared Polis took office than we've lost in the military in Afghanistan in the last 20 years. This is a crisis. We've got to cancel our status as a sanctuary state so that ICE agents can do their job. We've got to make any amount of fentanyl a felony and put drug dealers in jail, which is not happening right now. Crime and drugs is destroying our communities here in Colorado. We should not be number one in auto theft or number two in increase in fentanyl deaths. It's just heartbreaking. It's affecting every family I know. You know, there's, there's some bills that were signed that um, led to this problem, whether it was Jared and the Democrats signing a bill that made it a misdemeanor to steal a car that was under $2,000 in value. Well, who does that affect? That affects the single mom with three kids in downtown Denver who has to get her kids to school and work and now doesn't have a car. That's not fair. That's not fair to the people of Colorado that we are number one in auto theft now. We've got to be tough on crime. We've got to make sure that we roll back these bad bills that were signed and support law enforcement. And again, I'm so proud to be endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police. They know I have a good plan. They know I have a heart for Colorado and that I will fix these problems as your governor. Mr. Polis, 90 seconds. Look, my, my opponent is partially right on this issue. I give her a B minus. We do need tougher criminal penalties. I was proud to sign a bill, one of the first states in the nation to add new felony penalties for pill presses. This is what's used to lace products that aren't marketed as fentanyl with our poison. They might only have a trace amount of fentanyl. We wanna make sure we put those people behind bars. New and tougher penalties for drug dealers. Increased funding for Colorado Bureau of Investigations, making sure that we go after uh, the people that are selling poison to our kids on the street. Uh, when I was in, uh, not too far from where my opponent lives in Lone Tree, just two days ago, I met, with a I met a father, he just happened to come up to me, who lost both of his sons to fentanyl poisoning. He thanked us uh, in the legislature for moving forward with a bipartisan bill that actually got tough on fentanyl dealers, but also went the rest of the distance because criminal uh, sentencing is not enough. We need to do it. We need to get tougher. We need to make sure we apprehend and detain those responsible and keep them behind bars. We also need to make sure that we have testing strips that are available to make sure that when something is contaminated, it's identified early before it harms or kills somebody. We need to make sure that we offer drug addiction and recovery treatment to those in need. Uh, that's something that our state can do better. We're working on building 500 new beds for addiction recovery and a treatment uh, at Ridgeview near the city of Aurora. And we know that we need to do more. For anybody who's had a family member or friend who suffered with opioid addiction or drug and alcohol addiction, uh, we know that we wanna do everything we can to help make sure that they can get sober and stay sober. Ms. Canal, 30 second rebuttal. Yeah, Jared, again, you're trying to fix the problems that you created. You want a second term to do that. That's not right. You created these problems. Are you willing to sign a bill that does make fentanyl any amount of felony? Because that's what needs to happen according to law enforcement. Are you willing to cancel our status as a sanctuary state, which you said you wouldn't do in the debate with Walker Stapleton, and then you did? And finally, will you tell us finally the truth about whether you took advice from Kim Kardashian on getting involved in the process for prosecution on that truck driver who killed four people in a fiery crash. Andy, you've got our next question. For the governor, Colorado voters approved wolf reintroduction two years ago now. It was a measure primarily passed by voters on the front range with an impact being implemented here in Western Colorado. Whether you agree with the underlying policy or not, how would you in your second term try to make this program as successful as possible for everybody involved? Yeah, and I want to be clear, uh, I didn't take a position on the ballot initiative, but I honor and respect the will of the people of Colorado. And we have a great team at Colorado Parks and Wildlife that's doing this in a thoughtful way, working to give farmers and ranchers the tools they need to reduce predation. By the way, there are wolves in, in Wyoming, there are wolves in most neighboring states that are strong ranching economies. We need to make sure we learn from that experience to make sure that wolves don't jeopardize our livelihoods in rural Colorado. 
Uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife presented a map that shows some of the areas that are both supportive of wolves and represent good habitat as potential sites. If I'm elected governor, the people of Colorado can be confident that I will honor the will of the voters. Uh, and, and you know, that's something I do whether I agree or disagree with the policy. Another example is the Family Act and family leave. I had a different and I like to think better model that wouldn't have cost as much to provide family leave to Coloradans. Voters disagreed. They passed another way to do it overwhelmingly. We are getting that implemented to make sure that every Coloradan gets the paid family leave that they need if they're sick or ill or have a child. And I treat anything that the voters do the same way. I will always honor the will of the voters and make sure that we hear from stakeholders across the state to make sure that Colorado's wolf reintroduction is a success not only for the people that voted for it, but also for the people that didn't vote for it and are skeptical of it, because it is the law of Colorado, and I'm going to do my best to make it work for everybody. Ms. Ganahl, 90 seconds. Yeah, Jared didn't answer the question, as usual, about whether he would roll back our sanctuary states. Well, the question was about wolves. And you also didn't answer the question whether you talked to Kim Kardashian That's the question to get was about advice wolves. on crime. It was about wolves. You don't answer the questions. I and did. You also are you going to get taking wolves? no credit for getting wolves here in Colorado, which is decimating, um, are going to decimate our rural Colorado farmers and ranchers. So it is a tragedy for ag, for game, um, for citizens here in Colorado that this was done. And unfortunately, the citizens of Denver and Boulder don't quite understand the implications of the vote they did. But, you know, we're going to do our best to make sure that we deal with it and support our farmers and ranchers. I will always support our ag industry here in Colorado, which is the second largest industry here. I won't be hosting a meat out day anytime soon. I'm married to one of the top barbecue cooks in the country. And I won't be poking the eye of the farmers and ranchers who produce amazing food across our state. They need our help. They need our support. They need us to have their back as a governor, and I will do that. I've been able to tour many of the ranches and farms across the state. 90% of them are family owned, been here for generations. And what's happening right now is not fair to them. They have been such an important part of our Colorado history and our Colorado future too. And I will always have their back as governor. I will be a governor for all of Colorado. Mr. Polis, 30 second rebuttal. You know, part of being a governor for all of Colorado is honoring the will of the voters. Uh, whether you disagree or agree with them, I'm going to administer the law of Colorado as effectively and efficiently as I can with the integrity that I owe to the people of Colorado. And I'll do that on every issue regardless. I also put my own recipe for brisket, uh, which I love to make at home for our kids uh, in, in newspapers across the country. You can Google Jared Polis brisket. I'm an amateur. Your husband's a professional. But after the election, maybe for charity, we can have a brisket uh, uh, taste test and, and see whose brisket is better. Thank you, Mr. Polis. Uh, Jason, you have our next question. Gotcha. When politicians talk about college students, their tendency is to talk about things like tuition costs, mm -hmm. student loans, or even the price of textbooks. I wonder what you would say to college students who find themselves struggling to get it by right now due to the impact inflation is having on their monthly budgets. Things like gasoline prices, food prices, or even skyrocketing rent all leave students wondering if they'll be able to complete their degrees. What will you do as governor to address it? Well, thank you. I know young people are hurting across the state. I've been a regent now for six years, and I spent a lot of time listening to these conversations and helping them figure out how to navigate this out of control inflation right now, the crime that's riddling our state, and the unaffordable housing that we're dealing with in this state as well. And I want every student in Colorado to feel hopeful and excited about the future and get to live the same American dream I got to. You know, as a kid who grew up in Monument, Colorado and got to start a business um, around something she loves dearly, dogs, I got to build the country's largest pet care franchise and it was such a joy. And I want every student to have that same opportunity. And right now, I feel like the American dream is dying right in front of us. Opportunity, too much government growth, too much regulation, too many taxes and fees. Jared Polis has grown the size of government here in Colorado by 25% and added 85 new taxes and fees. That's part of the reason inflation is so out of control here. So I want to roll up my sleeves, reduce the size of government, reduce taxes and fees, make sure that we make sure, make sure that we can um, provide housing that's affordable and give you a bright future here. And in order to do that, we've got to give you hope again. We've got to get our economy back on track. The CU Business School just came out with their business index about how people are feeling, small business owners are feeling about the economy right now. And they're very pessimistic in Colorado. And we lost almost 30% more small businesses in the first half of this year. I'm very, very worried about our state, and I'll do everything I can as an entrepreneur and a CEO to fix it. Mr. Polis, 90 seconds. You know, in my last uh, State of the State address before the state legislature, I challenged the state legislature to find 
50 ways to save people money. I even sang the Paul Simon, 50 ways to save you money. I was so proud that working with Republicans and Democrats, we produced over 100 ways to reduce fees and taxes, cut costs, and make Colorado more affordable. We were one of the first, one of the first states in the nation to cap the out-of-pocket cost of insulin. Preschool and kindergarten saving families thousands of dollars a year. We eliminated all state income tax for seniors on social security income. We cut property taxes by over $700 million over the next two years. And if I'm reelected, we want to work on a bipartisan plan to make those reductions permanent because no one should be priced out of where they live simply because the value of their home has gone up. Two, uh, it touched to the state income tax. Funded the child tax credit, family for low income fa money for low income families, the earned income tax credit, make work pay, helping families get ahead. And the question, of course, was particularly about students. And we need to do more to save students money and provide additional economic opportunity. Of course, that starts with tuition and fees. CMU has helped to lead the way in reducing costs for students, including zero textbook costs. But we also know that housing factors in, housing for students. And of course, once they graduate for young professionals, we need to make sure that we remove barriers to housing close to where jobs are, reducing commuting time, reducing traffic, and giving more Coloradans the opportunity to realize the dream of home ownership and build equity over their lives earlier in their life, rather than having to continue to rent throughout their lives. Ms. Ganahl, 30 second rebuttal. Well, again, he's had four years to create a bright future for our students and things are pretty bad right now. As you heard, small businesses are closing. Inflation is record high, 40 year record high and the highest in the country here in Colorado. And we've got to we've got to relook at this economy and figure out how to get it going. So I have some big, bold ideas about how to do that by reducing regulations, fees, and going to zero income tax over eight years, like Tennessee did successfully. They're one of the hottest economies in the country now. We can do that here in Colorado. Gretchen, I think you have the next question. Looking at the annual School Finance Act, do you believe school districts in Western Colorado are treated <coughs> fairly by the state of Colorado? Why or why not? If re-elected governor, what can parents expect from you with respect to making sure their children on this side of the Rockies receive an education on par with their peers in the metro areas? Mr. Polis, 90 seconds. Look, my opponent uh, just touted her tax scheme with regards to the income tax. It's simply a math issue that this would gut funding for our schools and force local governments to raise property taxes. That's the opposite of what we need. We've prioritized our School Finance Act, and I'll get into some of the improvements that we've made in it. Uh, the last year alone, we increased funding for a class of 25 kids by over $12,000. Uh, and that's for smaller class size, better teacher pay. Many school districts are also restoring programs that have been cut, like the arts and others. And we need to continue that progress to make sure we invest in our schools and our future, and of course, make sure that that money reaches the classroom. Uh, but we also need to make sure that we fund the learning needs of all lear learners. I was so proud this year uh, to sign uh, an, a part of the School Finance Act, a separate bill that better funds special education. We also now allow charter schools and consortiums of charter schools to be able to be their own administrative units for special ed. That might sound wonky. My opponent and I are both into education, but it's actually pretty cool. It means if a charter school can innovate or working with other charter schools create a better way to serve our learners with unique needs, then they're able to work directly with the federal government to do that. They don't have to hire, unless they want to, the district to provide the special education services. The School Finance Act is the single biggest thing we fund as a state. If you eliminated the income tax, you would cut funding for our schools by almost half. I will not allow that to happen as governor. I'll continue to reduce fees, costs, and the income tax responsibly. I share the goal of reducing the income tax with my opponent, but we need to do it in a way that adds up because I believe in math. Ms. Canole, 90 seconds. Well, Derek, you have the math problem. You made empty promises about going to zero income tax by using a carbon tax, but yet you wanna get rid of carbon emissions here in Colorado. That doesn't add up at all. And my plan has actually been proven or been uh, looked at by the Independence Institute. Some economists said it would work. It's ambitious, but it'll work. What it'll do, it will get our economy back on track. Right now, we are languishing. We have one of the highest inflation rates in the country. It's almost unaffordable to live here. Our young people can't stay here. Our senior citizens can't stay. We've got to go bold and ambitious and do what we can to put more money back into the pockets of the people of Colorado. And my plan does that by not, not reducing any pro programs or services, but doing it slow over time and not increasing other taxes. 
My goal is to make Colorado great in our future for our kids, our senior citizens, for young families. And right now that's not happening. We've got to make some big, bold moves to turn things around. You've had four years to do the work and we're not headed in the right direction. I will make sure we do head in the right direction. And on schools, Oh my goodness, there's so much more we can do to help rural schools. Like make sure that charter schools are able to open. I'm very excited about Ascent opening over here on the Western Slope. I was one of the founders of that charter school network. And I tried to open one right in Jared Polis' backyard in Boulder Valley School District with 700 kids signed up and it was turned down and he didn't do anything to help. So if he, if he truly cared about school choice, I think he would have helped out in that manner with 700 kids interested in doing so. But we've got to give power back to parents and go all in on school choice and fund the family not the system. Mr. Polis, 30 second rebuttal. We have one of the strongest economies in the nation. We have below the national unemployment rate. There's more jobs today in Colorado than there were before the pandemic. Our economy is growing strong. Uh, we continue to create jobs and draw major employers to Colorado from Texas, from California, from New York, because we're the best state to do business. We have low taxes and more freedom than any other state. We've eliminated Social Security tax for seniors to make life more affordable for retirees. We want to make sure that we're, we made it $1 to start a business in Colorado. It was normally $75, $100. Uh, that increased new business formation by over 18% in the last quarter, giving more people the access to entrepreneurship that my opponent and I had to create jobs and create a living for themselves. Thank you, Mr. Polis. We'll now move into our closing remarks. Candidate uh, Ms. Ganahl, you have the first two minutes for your closing remarks. Well, thank you. Jared wants you to reelect him to try to fix the problems that he created. Polis is the problem, crime, inflation, drugs. When you vote, hold him accountable. And when I'm governor, I expect you to do the same with me. I'm a problem solver, not a politician. I will get the job done. I'll turn things around here. I've been so blessed to live the American dream and now I'm a mom on a mission to make sure our kids and grandkids can have the same opportunity that I did and my husband did. My family means everything to me and so does our home here, Colorado. I will not stand by and watch this beautiful state, my kids' state, be destroyed. As your governor, I'll put law and order leadership in charge. I'll have the backs of law enforcement in our state always. Under Polis, we have the highest inflation rate in the nation due to his radical tax and spend approach and extreme energy policies. As governor, I'll unleash Colorado's economy and put more money back into your pocket by taking us to zero income tax like Tennessee did and cutting red tape to make sure housing is affordable again and producing energy again here in Colorado where we do it best. I'm a mom on a mission to make sure our kids can read and write with a common sense curriculum, that we address the mental health crisis that they are facing. I will go all in on school choice, make sure that the funding follows the family, give power back to parents. I'm offering a brighter future in Colorado with big, bold ideas like I've talked about tonight. I will give parents the choice to vaccinate their child. I will not upend the justice process with the help of Kim Kardashian. I will always tell you the truth and be transparent with you. Will Jared release his taxes too? He wants you to reelect him to try to fix the problems that he created. Don't let him. When you vote, hold him accountable. I ask for your vote. Join me, we can turn Colorado around together. Thank you, Ms. Ganell. Mr. Polis, two minutes for closing remarks. Thank you, President Marshall, uh, Andy, Gretchen, and Jason. Uh, thank you for your work to my opponent, Regent Canal, to our viewers at home. Thank you for doing the research and taking the time to learn uh, about the candidates for governor because who we choose makes a big difference in protecting and expanding freedom in Colorado. Uh, I, it's simple, I, I support uh, more freedom and lower taxes. I've delivered on that as governor for the last four years and I'll continue to fight every day to expand freedom and make Colorado the very best state in the nation to live, to work, to raise a family and retire. My opponent's a mad mom. I'm a happy dad. I know there's a lot of happy moms and dads out there that of course recognize that Colorado is doing some amazing work. Maybe it's a teacher you like at your local neighborhood school. Maybe it's the fact that uh, the highway you commute to work on is finally getting repaired. Maybe you see you got to just, just got a promotion at work. But I know the Coloradans also know uh, that there's a lot of work ahead. And our next governor will be tasked with keeping costs low, making housing more affordable, and continuing to work to expand the American dream right here in Colorado. I take the experience from the business sector that I created growing companies and expanding opportunity to help make sure I use that to make government more efficient, leaner and meaner. We're reducing uh, our state offices by over a million square feet and passing those savings along to taxpayers by reducing costs. 
Colorado's have the opportunity to choose uh, either uh, an out of touch uh, extreme uh, candidate for governor who's dead set on taking Colorado backwards. Uh, she herself has said she's the MAGA candidate for governor, or we can choose a problem solver. I'm data driven. I believe in taking the best ideas from the left, the right, the middle, from everywhere to move Colorado forward and improve the quality of life for the residents of our great state. I love Colorado. We're raising our kids here. I'll always do what's right for Colorado and deliver in making Colorado an even more amazing place. Together, we're going to make Colorado one of the 10 safest states over the next five years. Together, we're going to reduce the cost of housing, both for ownership and rental. And together, we're going to make sure that Colorado continues to be the very best place to live in the entire country. My name is Jared Polis, and I humbly ask for your support. Thank you, Mr. Polis, and thank you to both of our candidates, Governor Jared Polis and Regent Heidi Ganahl. Thank you to our panelists and to each of you at home. Thank you for tuning in and listening this evening. We hope tonight's forum was informative and helpful as you exercise our most precious power as Americans, the power to choose our elected officials peacefully at the ballot box. I'd like to thank the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel, Colorado Public Radio, and KRCC for partnering with Colorado Mesa University in making this candidate forum possible. Now, be sure to stay tuned for the second half of tonight's doubleheader featuring candidates for the United States Senate. We'll be right back.